Welcome, Barbara Imhoff, to SIOC. Thanks, Havik, for having me here and for speaking to me. How do you, as an architect, come from kind of a traditional educational background into space architecture? How did that transition happen for you? I think uh, studying uh, with uh, Wolf Briggs at the University of Applied Arts in his master class is um, beyond the ordinary, I would say. <laughs> I was very much interested always in technology, but also in, in the environment or environmental systems. I was uh, also interested in the future very much mm -hmm. and how we would live in the future. And when you think further and further, then you also get to think, you know, what if we live on the moon or on mm -hmm. Mars or even beyond. And I think this is when, when I started investigating, you know, how do we live in these completely different environments, very extreme, very far mm -hmm. away, and where can I learn more about it? Uh, do you also see there being a correlation to kind of like what's happening here on Earth in terms of like climate change? Our um, conditions become more extreme and it actually it gets closer to these extreme conditions in space. On the other hand, humans are you know, the, we are still the same. We are. We have this physical body. We have um, hardly any, you know, better extensions, technological extensions, uh, which make us, uh, you know, fitter to survive in extreme environments. So we need to uh, sustain ourselves with food and oxygen and water and a shelter, which keeps also our te body temperature somehow in mm -hmm. in a certain range. And the interesting part is that when we think about creating this kind of balance between all these systems and the regeneration of water and air and getting also the food production into the loop, uh, then it becomes very interesting because this is a conceptual approach on looking at life and architecture. Can you speak about some of the projects that you are currently working on or have worked on in the recent past that deal with this kind of recycling of all the waste that we're producing in, into a coherent kind of system? I mean, in general, I have to say that there are many developments uh, we can see in architecture or in urban planning which take the direction of a more sustainable environment or creating more sustainable structures uh, for humans to inhabit. Uh, but it's more extreme when you go and look um, into space and it's very imminent. You have to always you know, look at the whole thing. You cannot just take one part out of it. More recently or currently we are working on a project uh, which is more about having three bioreactors in one. It's called Living Architecture. Mm -hmm. And it's about creating a wall or a partition wall or just a whole building which has a large bioreactor or parts of a bioreactor which completely recreate a new uh, system of waste treatment. We can have enough water to flush toilets, to water plants, or even we have integrated um, greenhouses, vertical mm. farming. There's an idea about materiality and how you can transport material to space. And I guess I, I've noticed there's like two different, fundamentally different approaches. One is to how can I make something very compact and small versus actually using resources that you can find on the moon. Uh, basically, when you go into space, uh, the biggest constraint is gravity. Gravity always pulls you back. Uh, mass is critical and size is critical, and, and that is why uh, we then always have to think of habitats or um, envelopes which are small, which are compactable, deployable, or which transform into bigger spaces. Thinking of compact living in cities, it's the same approach. And so you have to, to cover the basics, but then it's also about who's going to be there. How will they interact? What do they need for interaction? And what do we as humans need to feel comfortable? In addition to, to that, the moon has no atmosphere. Mars has little atmosphere. So the moon and Mars both have a lot of radiation. How can we protect people from radiation with heavy materials? So that is when, when we really need to look at maybe creating habitation areas in caves, in, in lava tubes uh, on the moon, or using the sand to create protected mm -hmm. spaces. This kind of segues into the question of like what role does design play? Well, we often think about space architecture as something that is not for designers, but is for uh, engineers or people that just, you think of that as being an, an industry that is mostly driven by rationale. Just was wondering if you can 
uh, speak a little bit about the role of design? In principle, one needs to first familiarize uh, oneself with the terminology mm -hmm. and also with the, I would say, the culture, the engineering, space engineering culture or scientific culture because it's quite different from architecture and design. And the second thing I would always recommend is first listen then talk. When you start talking to them and you start talking about you know, how to develop this picture, then suddenly they realize that architects and designers can also do more mm -hmm. than just right. these pictures. So it's just an entry point. It's a, it's a starting point for a conversation. Mm -hmm. And when we then talk about the spaces or how would we design that, currently we work on the Gateway project. And of course it starts off with, okay, here are the crew systems. This is, you have to keep the crew alive, creating these private spaces, but also giving the, the crew an opportunity to foresee options of flexibility. Personalize it. Personalize it. And then you have to see microgravity is, is also very particular because there's no real direction. So you probably want to create direction. You want to create specific light conditions because mm -hmm. we are still you know, earthlings and we are used that the light comes you know, from, from the sun, right. from above. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and then of course it's about materialities. When you look at space station right now, it's it's very hard. It's white. It's it's a little bit of, you know blue handles. And then mm -hmm. how can we introduce different textures? How is this kind of interfacing with big co corporations and a lot of bureaucracy? The European Space Agency, but also the European Framework Program. There are large organizations or funding bodies with a lot of bureaucracy, mm -hmm. uh, which at the beginning is completely overwhelming. But I think you just got to get into it. I think what makes us competitive is the uh, interdisciplinary nature mm -hmm. so that we do have these space engineers because that's why uh, other engineering companies take us seriously. Also we have um, scientists and so we have people who understand the scientific nature and can translate if necessary. Thank you Barbara for coming here to SAIC. Thank you for having me here. <laughs>